all the time till it becomes radioactive, till it's you know very radioactive, and you can reduce that radioactivity by filtration or by precipitation or whatever. Lots of chemist chemistry, and you'd have to do that more or less forever. You'd, it would have it would have to become a sort of like a permanent engine for keeping it cool and isolating it from the environment. And that, that's all I can think of doing. I mean, apart from that, I can't think of anything. And I think even that probably wouldn't wouldn't work perfectly. But it's better than, you know, it's better than anything else. It's the kind of best shot, really. I can't see there's any way of dismantling it in such a way that you can pull bits out of it and 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 separate them and make it safe. I can't see how that could be done. But then this is just me. I don't. I mean, I'm not a reactor engineer. I'm just a physical chemist. I don't know if you can answer this, but can frequency contain or neutralize radiation? Could a large-scale frequency array be built around Fukushima to contain the releases? Kind of right. Like the no, the answer is you couldn't. No. I mean, no. this is just this is just impossible. There's no physics that, that would underpin such a thing. I mean, a lot of people. I've seen a, there's an awful lot of people who, who, who do sort of science fiction approaches to radiation. You know, you, uh, uh, but they're a bit on the same level as the Russians' idea that you can save yourself from radiation by drinking vodka. Uh, and there is no frequency that will, that will... Ionizing radiation is like a fundamental physical um, reality which cannot be dealt with apart, apart from hiding from it or shielding yourself from it. That's it. There's nothing you can do. There's no frequency that, you can, that will deal with it. Dr. Busby, what do you think are the, the long-term health ramifications for the U.S. and Canada? Should we only be concerned about the Pacific Ocean contamination and the tsunami debris, or will we be continued, or will it, or will we continue to be hit with atmospheric fallout? Will we continue to be hit with atmospheric fallout if the plant? Okay. Is okay. Well, actually, I don't think that the, uh, the, I mean, what what you have to realize is that you were hit with an awful lot of atmospheric fallout at the time of the weapons testing in 1959 to 1963. And a lot of people in Canada died as a result of that. A lot of cancer increased, a lot of infant mortality, because there's a lot of rain and snow in Canada, and, it all, and a lot of it came down there. And this is, this is not as bad as that. So, so what, what's, what has happened in Fukushima, and, and of course, there's not an awful lot of stuff coming out of it now. Most of what was going to come out has landed on Canada, and actually it wasn't an awful lot. I mean, I have, I have looked quite closely at this. I've looked at the weather patterns. I've looked at the measurements. I've even had other people have sent me samples because I was concerned about it because there are lots of people driving around with Geiger counters measuring radioactivity. And also a lot of that radioactivity is from radon, I have to say, okay? So when people wipe down their windscreens and say, oh, well, you know, it's terribly high, the radioactivity, and they think it's all coming from Fukushima, or there's some big cover-up, or whatever, I, th I think it's, it's not. I, th I think that the evidence, as far as I can tell, and I know a bit about this, I do a lot of measurements myself, is that there's not a lot of stuff coming now from Fukushima, and probably at the beginning there was some, but it was nothing like the quantity that came from the weapons fallout. So I don't think you need to worry too much about it, unless, of course, I'm wrong and the whole thing blows up, you know, um, which, which I, I guess there is a finite chance of that. Something strange could happen. It could all, you know, melt down and filter into a little hole in the rock and then become concentrated in some way and there could be a nuclear explosion. But, as, but if it's just distributed into the grounds, um, I don't think that will happen. So I don't think you need to worry too much about it. The Pacific Ocean will become contaminated, the fish will be contaminated, um, and of course you get the salmon, you get fish on fishing on the west coast of Canada, and, and shellfish, and coast, the coasts will become contaminated. But it won't be as contaminated as it was from, from the weapons fallout. So, so I don't think this is the end of the world that everybody's saying. I think it's just like one more nail in the coffin. I have to say that I think you know that the, the, the weapons fallout and the, and the and the nuclear reactors and the uranium mining in Canada are very serious. That is dust going everywhere, um, and and uh, the, the particles from Iraq and Afghanistan floating around the world. These these are probably just as serious, and and everything adds up and adds up and adds up. So. What we're seeing is the death of the genetic structure of the human race and all life. But it's not just Fukushima, you know. It's everything. They're all adding and adding and adding and adding. It's very, very serious. Very, very serious. It's, 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 it's terrifying. This question is 
question came from D. Wolpoff. When do you expect the brunt of ocean contamination to hit Hawaii? I think it probably already has. I can't see that it's going to get a lot worse than, than it is now. But I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't followed. The, the currents generally go north from, from as far as I can make out. But the, the, they, they go up north along the coast of Japan. And then they come around in a circle and then come down again. But then the fish swim against the current. So I, I, mean, I couldn't say. I, I, I certainly know the particles have got to Hawaii because we've measured them there. So the air, the the air, the aerial um, contamination has come to Hawaii, but it's not very large. It's not a huge amount. My concern is the, is, is the uranium particles and the plutonium particles, and I guess that they 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 will have got to Hawaii already. But I, as far as the water is concerned, I I don't know. I don't, I, I, I would have thought that whatever is going to get there has got there. This question came from Tim Lastly. Um, do you feel from some of the car filter tests that the West Coast cities of Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, or LA uh, may be unsafe to be doing outdoor activities? Okay, well I've actually looked at car filters from uh, Japan and the outdoor activity in the car filters from Japan is not, is not that great. And, that, and that's, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of cesium-137, there's a lot of lead-210, there is some uranium-235 and probably some plutonium. Um, I wouldn't have thought that by the time you get, like, it's 2,000 miles away. I know it's downwind, but the concentrations, I think, on the west coast of America are not, are not hugely high. And, in fact, I have looked at filters. People have sent me a filter from Los two. I've had two filters from Los Angeles. I've had two filters from Vancouver. And I looked at both of those and haven't found anything much in them at all. So I didn't get too worked up about that, no. This and also, you see, that luckily for you, luck, well, you know, luckily for the United States, for a continent, um, it's a very, very long way from Japan. And, and the winds generally go north and, and come down. They go up over the Arctic and then come down. So some of that stuff's come down into Sweden, come into the Baltic states and to Denmark. Um, and it's, of course it's come down the coast into into the United States and in fact it's even gone down to Florida. It, it all depends on the, the directions of the wind. And some of it of course got to California for sure. But not a huge amount, you know. Nothing, nothing, and there's no need for you to go to the bomb shelter and lock yourself in. It's not as bad as that. It was much, much worse during the, the nuclear weapons testing. So I hope I can give some kind of reassurance to all these people who are freaking out. I, d I don't think it's as bad as, people, as a lot of people are saying. I think there's a, there's a, lot, a lot too much panic going on. It, I mean, as far as the J Japanese are concerned, that they should be panicking. Absolutely. Because it's, quite, it's a sort of local affair. Do you have a plan for relocation to the southern hemisphere if something happened to the spent? fuel pool of reactor? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that's necessary. But if there was an, if something really bad happened to the spent fuel pool and it went off bang, then I think I might have to think about what I was going to do. Um, but, I, 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 you know, you can't... You, um, I, I, tell, I have to tell you that I've spent most of my life worrying about nuclear war. Now, nuclear war is, is, is uh, an, a completely different order of magnitude compared to Fukushima. I mean, if, they'd been, if there was a nuclear war, you would really be in trouble. You'd have to think very carefully about all that relocating to the southern hemisphere business. Fukushima is not such a big deal because, you see, I mean, you're not going to get a 10 megaton explosion out of Fukushima. You, you might get a nuclear explosion, but I don't think it would be a, a very efficient one. So there would be an enormous bang, and it would blow all sorts of radioactive crap up into the, into the sky, but it wouldn't blow it through the stratosphere. Because it has to go up several, you know, 20 kilometers, something like that, you know, a long way up, um, to 50,000 feet anyway, to get through into the stratosphere, and then it starts to go around, around the stratospheric circulation and land on, on everybody. So I think if it went up, it would probably mostly land in the Pacific, and it would finish off quite a large fraction of Southeast Asia. But I, I think probably where I am in, in, in Wales, or if I'm in France or in Latvia or wherever I happen to be, it's not such a big deal. So it would be just a question of hang, hanging about until the, the, the fast radioisotopes decayed away, which is about a month or so. 
And then it's business as usual. But business in this case, as usual, is the slow destruction of the earth. So, I mean, if there's any message that I should give tonight to, to the people listening, it is that we really do have to stop nuclear pollution. And in fact, it might be already a bit too late. And we're, we're, we've got, you know, fertility problems, we've got genetic damage problems, we've got lots of species, we've got all sorts of really, really awful things. I mean, there are no birds. The birds, all the little birds are gone. I, I mean, it's, it's really serious. It's really serious. But it's not just Fukushima. It's the whole, it's the whole package. I've got, I've got a boat anyway, so if it gets too bad, I'll, I'll sail my boat south. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we, we recently learned in the last few days about uh, the butterfly studies uh, regularities yeah. were found in eye development, malformed wings. Going back to May of uh, 2011, a biologist stated that the study is overwhelming in its implications for humans, and another said it's a pr pretty clear indication that something has gone wrong in the ecosystem. What does yeah. the butterfly study tell us from your perspective? This is nothing new. I mean, after Chernobyl, there was a woman called Cornelia hesse Honiger, who was a, a, an illustrator, an, a, um, a scientific illustrator, and she traveled all over Europe to, to nuclear reactors and to places near Chernobyl, uh, finding mutated bugs and drawing them, and she made a huge great book. And you can find a lot of her pictures on the internet, Hess, Hess Honiger, very, very nice woman, very, very clever. Um, and so that was after Chernobyl. And uh, so now we're seeing the same thing after Fukushima. Everything that happened after Chernobyl, you will find after Fukushima. It, it, it'll be, it's exactly the same. In fact, we, we published a book called, called you know, Fukushima, What to Expect, which was based on what we discovered after Chernobyl. The real problem is that everybody knows this, but nobody can do anything about it. This is, I mean, I, I go to conferences all over the world. I go to, you know, recently I was in Geneva, and then I, I was in Vilnius, and I've been in Stockholm, just in this last year. And all, all of the people like yourselves, you know, that, and, and scientists, they come along and they say, oh, well, we have this mutated bug, and look at these people who are dying. I mean, recently, my colleague, Harbin Sherb, was able to show using mathematical statistics that after Chernobyl and also after the weapons fallout in the 60s, there was a displacement of the proportion of boys born to the proportion of girls. This is called the sex ratio. And it's an absolute constant in human populations, the number of boys born to the number of girls. So it's 1,050 boys to 1,000 girls. It's a, it's a standard statistical indicator of genetic health. And after, uh, and after radiation, it, it was perturbed. So after Chernobyl, it changed. After um, the weapons fallout, it changed. People living close to nuclear power stations, it changes. And you'll find that it changes after Fukushima as well. And what that means, although it might seem rather arcane, what it means is that millions of boys have died. Millions of girls have died, depending upon which way the, the, the sex ratio change is. This depends upon whether the father has been more irradiated than the mother. But it, but it means that we, we, we are really perturbing the genetic integrity of, the, of planet Earth. And that's why you're getting mutated butterflies and mutated roses. I saw a mutated rose, and then there was that famous bunny with no ears. And, but all that stuff we found after Chernobyl, you know, animals with two heads, it all works. Um, and, of course, nobody can have babies now. My, my, my friend here, Pakistani friend, he says that when he's... Um, friends go back to Pakistan and marry young women and want to start raise a family, they can't because not, not, they can't have babies and they just try for years and years and years and they can't have babies. When I was young, you just had to shake some woman's hand and she'd have a baby. I mean, it just doesn't happen anymore. I was on the underground in London at the Tube and there's an advertisement there for women over 30 to have free IVF treatment, okay? Women over 30, they're giving free IVF treatment to that, to flush all the eggs out, to make sure they get one that works. It's terrifying. I've learned that um, fasciation is quite, quite rare in nature, but not around new plant accidents. And since we put out a call for images to the public at large, we received hundreds of images sent to us from the U.S. and Canada, primarily from the West Coast, B.C., and Alberta. And many of these people are avid gardeners or have grown their own produce for years. What they're seeing is very unusual. Um, have you had an opportunity to view some of these images from the States or from Canada? And are any of them similar? No, no not really, no. 